Shall we start? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hi, I'm Joseph. I'm uh, the project manager and assistant curator from Parasite. We are very happy to invite uh, Rainbow Chan, the Australian artist, uh, producer, and vocalist, to come to our Parasite Pay Studio visit today. Um, hi, Rainbow. Hello. Thank you Are for having you... me. I'm good, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, Rainbow uh, is a producer, vocalist, and artist, and her her practice often engage with this uh, translation, diaspora, and the effect of globalization on modern Chinese society. She is currently researching uh, women's oral history, folk songs, and language with a focus of in her ancestral ties to white Tao people, the first settler of Hong Kong. Um, hi, Rainbow. I, I know you did a project uh, for the Sydney Opera House. There is a project that uh, tribute to the Wong Kar Wai's famous film, uh, In the Mood of Love. Maybe you can talk more about this project to us first. Sure, yes. So this was a um, this was a very challenging project because it was at the height of COVID um, this year and a lot of different live performances and venues had to reimagine what it meant to do a live concert. So the Sydney Opera House um, commissioned myself and two other artists from Australia who have um, ties to Chinese heritage to pay tribute to Wong Gawai and Hong Kong and everything that's happened, you know, this last year, a lot of changes socially, politically. Uh, and um, it started off with um, just trying, we didn't even know what it was going to look like at the beginning because the format was so different to anything we've done before. The stage at the Opera House, the capacity, I think is a thousand people maybe, but the hall was completely empty. So we were performing to an empty concert hall, but everything was going to be digitally live streamed on their um, YouTube channel and on their website. So it meant that um, we had to it allowed us actually to explore um, new technologies um, and, and actually replicate a lot of the camera angles from the film, um, Fa Yun Lima, on, on the digital screen. So although there were restrictions in terms of the live audience, there were actually a lot of new possibilities that allowed us to explore and be more creative. Um, so basically the project was, um, us writing some original songs that were in the style of the movie or inspired by themes in the movie. And then also reinterpreting some of the, some of the um, music from the soundtrack. So I might just share a bit of the concert with you first um, to give you some context and I'll go a bit more into detail about the process. Thank you. 
It is a restless moment. She has kept her head lowered to give him a chance to come closer. But he could not for lack of courage. She turns and walks away. So I'll just talk a little bit about that opening sequence. So everything we've everything we're doing is in live real time. Um, so the narrator, our friend Eugene Choi, who was the girl with the black in the black background, she um, her role in the production was to be the translator, uh, at the narrator of the storyline, and her dialogue was um, bits from the movie. Um, that we've taken out, not necessarily in order of the film, but just important ideas that we thought we wanted to encapsulate in our production. Um, and then at the beginning, when you saw the um, my friend Marcus on one side and me on the other side, that's actually a split screen. So because we couldn't actually physically be um, very close to each other, we had to um, use technology such as split screen cameras to make it seem like we were next to each other. But in fact, we were actually five meters away from each other at all times. So that was um, quite, quite an interesting exercise um, and have to try and look at each other as though we're really close, but we're actually very, very far away. Um, but we thought that that actually was an interesting addition to the storyline of this movie where the two main characters who are falling in love with each other can never be together. And so while they're physically, their neighbors, they live next to each other, but they can't touch, they can't kiss. And it's this always um, this idea of distance and longing. So we tried to utilize some of those ideas in the way we put this together. Um, and as you can see, I'm wearing the cape hole. And so I'm trying to be Maggie Jung. <laughs> and um, Marcus, the guy before playing the saxophone is playing the character of Tony Leung. And um, instead of trying to recreate the movie exactly the same, we knew we would never be able to do that because it's such an amazing classic movie. And we, if we try to do it, it would just be a bad ripoff. So um, instead, we tried to do uh, um, try to capture the essence through music. So um, you can see um, with our stage and our settings, um, they're very minimal purposely very minimal sets with just the bed, the mirror and some flowers. And we tried to keep it in the style of the 60s um, from the movie, but everything is made to look as though it is a set. So we, we wanted to show that it's a fantasy, it's a dream sequence. It's sort of bits of the memories that we have of growing up in Hong Kong or bits of the memories we have of the movie. Um, and so, yeah, that kind of uh, influenced our set design uh, I might play a bit of um, the, a bit later on, there is a, a dance sequence that we did that was inspired by a deleted scene in the movie. Um, but you can get an idea of the set a bit better. So it's very, it's very minimal. We've got the office on one side. You have um, the red velvet curtains that we see in the movie a lot. And then we have this um, telephone table where she gives him a call and he doesn't, she, he answers and she doesn't say anything. So there's sort of these little moments in the movie that we've tried to recreate.
closet there. So you can see from the the dance sequence going into this song, yeah. um, it's very much live. So I'm literally going from that that wow. part of the stage into this part. Um, and that this song is an original song that was um, commissioned that I had written. Um, and it's inspired by Wong Fei and Dan Lai Guan, Teresa Tang, but like that kind of old style of um, Cantonese and Mandarin um, pop music that um, my mum listened to. And when I moved to Australia, so I, I should premise this, yeah. so I was born in Hong Kong. I was born in Hong Kong in um, 1990. And then I moved to Australia when I was six years old. So a lot of my inspiration and my artistic um, style, I guess, is influenced by that 90s and just a little bit before the 90s Cantonese um, pop culture. So I love Gua Fu Sing and Lao De Wa and the Se Dai Tin Wong, those type of, um, uh, that type of style, because yeah. it's like, I am stuck I'm stuck in that era. I never, I didn't, I didn't see all the things like twins and all them afterwards. Like, I don't know any of that style. I only know the old style. Like come back to Hong Kong uh, during that time or you like literally spend your whole childhood in Australia? Uh, most of it in Australia. I came oh. back to Hong Kong once when I was 10 years old, but for a very short time and just to visit family. But um, the next time I went back to, went back to Hong Kong was maybe when I was 19. So I had spent a lot of my basically growing up in Australia. Yeah. And, uh, and I think what has been very interesting is that um, I, I actually find that tension between growing up between uh, Hong Kong culture or Chinese culture and Australian culture and, um, and I guess Western culture uh, to be very productive. At first it was very uncomfortable because I always would feel like I was different to everyone else or I didn't belong to Australian culture and then I also didn't belong to Hong Kong culture. I went back to Hong Kong and people asked me where are you from? Why, why do you speak like Guai <laughs> Mui? And, and feel, feel like oh no I, I can't you know I, I don't belong in either places and so now what I find to be very productive is to actually look at the the contradictions um, and and the tension between these supposedly different cultures but but as we become more and more globalized and yeah. as um, we are able to access information from the past like just like this I think that that um, is flattening out so that that's what most of my research looks at is to look at the politics of cultural representation and how it's evolving and changing in our global age yeah um, but I'm also a pop musician. I'm a pop singer. Uh, yeah, I, I, want I was to doing ask. that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Because like in this like short, I, I think we'll have a ten minutes talk already. Like we see you as a musician. We see you as a singer. We see you as you know actress, uh, performer. So yeah, tell us more about our background. Because I see you're taking many different like artistic roles. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So my original. Um, I'll just get up the sort of more traditionally music information. So I started off being a pop singer and producer. So I, I love electronic music, I, but I also was trained in classical saxophone and piano and I did choral singing. I was part of a choir for many, many years. And I also studied music at university. So with that background, I um, decided to pursue music and, and write pop songs and um, at first most of them are just love songs and I didn't really think too much about uh, my I guess how I was represented I just wanted to make pop music and put it out but the thing that made me start to become more and more interested in the politics of representation was my music was never um, heard as just being music it was always like but what about the Chinese element? Or what about your woman? So can you tell me more about like like the woman like perspective or something? So and that's so, the part of God during those uh, like during interacting with the audience or press. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mainly, I think mainly press as well because um, back then, I mean, I started 
putting music out 10 years ago. And I think before social media, um, especially in Australia, there was still this belief that Australia culture is white, is um, male dominated. And especially because I make electronic music, people would always assume that a man had made the music and I was just the singer or the pretty face or something. And so um, that was always such a frustrating frustrating um, factor for me. And I always felt like I had to prove myself extra compared to some of my peers who could just be understood as a musician uh, or a producer. But I was always, there was always this baggage I had to explain and, and prove myself. Um, and so I took that frustration and decided to, um, I guess, explore it more critically in the realm of art um, and, um, and I got a few opportunities through some local galleries to do some performance art pieces and some gallery based pieces, which then helped to expand my practice into installation um, and uh, more interdisciplinary um, practice, which I think is actually um, very exciting for me because I can still make my pop music, but I just have this extra element now where I can have conversations like this um, with people to think about um, you know that the space of a three minute pop song doesn't allow me to do so um i'll show you uh some some of my music from back in the day so this is very very long time ago uh two th oh, okay maybe not that long ago but this is more sort of just pop music um inspired by the the uh the the old pop stars <laughs> Some of the more traditional pop things and um, this other video clip I can also show you this was uh, inspired by I think Wangawe again so kind of uh, very colorful um, love story And the, all the video clips I was doing were still very DIY. Most of, wow. most of them created by my friends. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, talking about uh, this like inspiration uh, of the like arts culture of Hong Kong. Like in your, I think more recent video on uh, Oblivion, I also see. Yes, if I actually went to Tong Choi Street last weekend. Yeah, to see all the oh, yeah. shops, the cash shops, the flower yes. shops. So I was like, oh yeah, this is the place you got a video shoot. Yeah, is that true? <laughs> yeah, I was. 
Yes, I was just going to show this one as well. Um, so this is probably yeah one of my later video clips that I, I did um, last year. Uh, and it was just it was crazy. It was like two weeks before the first big protest. And I was just in all the same areas. And so for me, this, this video has an extra meaning, I guess, just the significance of the landscape and the places that I, I, I was at. Um, so this one I can also share. brand yuck piece yep, yes yes so the yeah so i guess for me the, there was a few different um different things i wanted to um portray in that song first of all um i i think um the everyday landscape in hong kong is something that i really appreciate because i've been away from it for so long so even when i just come home and i can uh have a, a, a lamb 
牛腩河或 something like just something really simple or like one tan min. I'm just like this is the best thing ever. I love this so much. And so even just walking through the Gai Si is like it's so it's so simple, but it means a lot to me. And I think、um, spending the first eighteen years of my life in Australia. I, I every time I I went back to Hong Kong, I never actually got to see anything because I would just be with my family and doing you know just yum cha with people and that's about it. But only only in my adult life when I actually started to connect with artists and friends in in Hong Kong, I sort of fell in love with the city again. And I started to、um, so in that video clip we were in Yao Ma Day and Jim Sa Jo and. Um, the the goldfish market and different places that I would be having coffee or lunch with my friends. So it was for me a, a love letter to、um, reconnecting with Hong Kong as as an adult,、um, but also thinking about the future and how you know the song is called Oblivion. You know things disappearing, things sinking, and things kind of becoming obscure. So.、Uh, It just made sense to、um, post my love letter to the city and think about the future that you know is on the things are on the brink of disappearance as well. So wearing something like the Yuck Pit shirt, even though it's like it's fashion, but there's a lot of symbolism in a lot of the iconography that they choose, or like the the public toilet, like watch your belongings thing, thing and the Victoria Harbour, those type of images and icons are part of our everyday.、Um, Suddenly, have this new meaning or new urgency when we think about the future of Hong Kong. Yeah, and I would also like recommend our audience、uh, to、um, go to the YouTube channel of Rainbows or、uh, go to Spotify to listen to、uh, the amazing video、uh, music and also watch、uh, the videos because you know、uh, not the best of quality during a Zoom meeting, but. Please go there, and I also know that、uh, this song is from your、um, most recent album,、um, Pillar. And I know、yes. one of the songs is not only you know、um, announced uh, on uh, your like music platform, it was also performed、uh, in in museum, the art gallery of、uh, New South Wales. Can we talk more about this work, Melt? Yes, Melt. So this one was um, no, wait, where is it at the top somewhere? Here we go. So this was again at the height of. Our COVID lockdown in in a, in Sydney and the Art Gallery of New South Wales, in order to stay connected with the community, decided to commission a, a range of live performances in the empty gallery space. So much like the Sydney Opera House performance, which was performed to an empty hall, this one was. Used utilizing the empty gallery space to do something unconventional. So I got asked to perform in front of、um, Hugo Rodinen's、um, mirror works here,、uh, and it, I thought to myself, okay, because this is such a unique opportunity, I wanted to sing the song a bit differently as well, and strip it back down to how I first started making music, which was just with a guitar. My voice and with a loop pedal, so、um, just very very minimal setup uh, and um, trying to I guess、uh, use the emotions and the echo of the gallery space to do most of the storytelling.、Um, so I'll just play a bit of that also. We can't hear、um, the music. Oh, you can't hear the music. Okay, let me try again.、Um, uh, maybe I will go share again. Yep. And anything. <laughs> Keep it. 
Yeah, so with that, with that song, I, I chose to sing that song because, um, well, the, the, the narrative of the song is about assimilating. So thinking about travel migration when, when I, I guess, from my personal perspective, um, when I came to Australia, I wanted to be the same as everyone else. I wanted to learn English. I wanted to eat the things that my Aussie friends were eating. I didn't want to eat the Chinese food. I didn't want to go to Chinese school. I didn't want to use chopsticks. And I mean, those are superficial things, but I think on a very deep level, I just wanted to belong. Um, so there's a line in there about, you know, my, my tongue has been changed or I can't fight back because my tongue is tied. Like I, I physically didn't at that point have the language to belong to people, to the people I was around. And so essentially you, you start to melt or your idea of who you are just disintegrates. Um, but I think what was really beautiful about this moment in time during COVID was that no matter where, who, what color your skin was, we're all in this pandemic together. And although it's, it's a horrible situation, but there's a sort of, I feel like there has been a sense of community in, in different circles that I felt where, where we come together and we've um, found more um, peace and solidarity in trying to lift each other up. So this was one example of that where I felt like it was a moment to um, really reflect on um, how we can stay connected through through art and through music and through, um, uh, through communicating. Um, yeah, so. I think it's very important to see the um, uh, always see the positive side of something that is you know very difficult to deal with, and also especially a more you know I don't know, like a tragic <laughs> uh, or like yeah. A, yeah in general like we have to spend time to think to digest and also to to work together on this. Um, but um, I know like this is not your only project. Uh, you uh, work on the idea of community and also to, uh, to reflect back your own heritage. Uh, I know you mm. also have something more, um, uh, say like more visual art or more um, like using the language maybe people from the contemporary art scene can understand um, uh, more. Do you want to talk mm -hmm. uh, about the uh, Waito uh, project uh, with us? Sure, yes. So um, my mum is a, a Waitunyan, a Waitao. Um, so she, her her family tree line can go back to the Dun, Dun clan, like for the first people who settled in, um, uh, in Sungai. So uh, she can speak the dialect, the Waitawa, but she never passed it on to us. So I guess as I was doing all this research about global culture and, and mistranslations, I started to think about how sad it would be one day that the, the Waitau language will disappear or it's not being passed on to me, so I'm not going to be able to continue it. So I asked my mum, say, can you teach it to me? And she said, actually, there is a lot of music and um, folk folk traditions that the women used to do that might be a quicker way for you to learn about the culture as well as learn the language because it's very connected and so three years ago I started to um, do a bit of research into um, the music that the women would sing so my mom my mom couldn't sing any of the songs because by her generation they started going to school. So the songs are intended to be the women's education. They will meet at um, uh, a, a, uh, a one person's house, which they call Zimoy or sister house. And then they will learn to sing all these different types of songs that all have different social functions. So one could be for weddings, one could be for a funeral, or it could be a, a New Year celebration song, or maybe it's just a song to help them keep farming and not lose the, the energy while they're on the farm. So um, uh, I three years ago, I started working with a community in Long Yak Tao. Um, to uh, learn a bit more about this music. Um, and they are part of a community centre that is run by the Caritas, um, Caritas Project, so Ming Oi, they're called Ming Oi, um, that charity. Uh, so 
there are about nine women in this community who can still sing the songs. They uh, range from like 80 to 90 something years old. And they were also the last group of women who were in arranged marriages. So they, um, they just had to get married with whoever the matchmaker said that they had to get with. Um, so for them, uh, what I've learned is that marriage wasn't seen as a happy thing, but it was actually seen as a, uh, a very sad thing. And the songs that will accompany a woman's marriage was called a hokkako or a bridal lament, where they spend about three to five days actually crying in front of the family to say goodbye and to say um, thank you, but I'm going away now to this new family. So uh, for my more contemporary art practice in the last few years, um, I've been trying to, number one, document some of these songs um, in, in, in conjunction with the, um, with the community pawpaw paw or elders I've been working with, um, but also try to create illustrations or a visual representation of some of these songs, because if it's oral culture, there's always going to be some sort of um, some sort of translation. If you write it down on paper, then it suddenly it doesn't have the same character anymore because the the meaning is meant to be performed. The meaning is meant to be felt. So I've been trying to find different ways to turn it into um, a visual language. So um, one example is earlier this year I was commissioned by. Art Space, which is a really um, fantastic um, not-for-profit organization in Sydney um, to create something for their digital platform, 52 Actions, uh, 52 Artists. And so um, what I've done for this work is I've interpreted one, one hokkago, which is called um, Fish Song, Bird Song, or Yu Man, Nil Man. So for, and, and each of these posts were, um, released on Instagram over the course of a week. So you'll see each um, image has the date on it. And so that was when it was published. So the first one was just a very abstract image of the word hop to try and set the mood for people and um, try to understand, I guess, um, uh, what was coming up. So that was the title card. And then the second, post that was made was actually um, a tribute to the granny who taught me this song. So this was a very interesting process for me because I wanted to make sure that um, the link or, or the, the connection to the original singer or the one, the elder who taught me the song was the most important thing that people heard first. So I didn't want them to just hear my version and then and then not think about the history. So this was just my way of acknowledging um, uh, this granny. And, um, and she was kind enough to allow me to share um, some images from her past and, and now as well. Um, so I'll, I'll play the original because I think it's very important to hear how it's been translated through my work, but, but to also hear the original um, song. So. ทองจักเบ่งเท่าไว้จนยีกวกมาอ๋อปากสิงจองบูรังอ๋อตังเจ้าตกสังอาอาจักยีฝูงจ้อยเจ้าเหย่าช่างสวยมาอ๋อไห
So that was uh, Man Fong Pyun Po Po. She's 84 years old and the recording was um, documented by the Caritas uh, Long Yak Tao Community Development Project. And if for anyone interested, they actually have a documentary that they made as well. Um, so this is a link um, which uh, I, I guess I could post it on the chat or maybe I can send it to um, Parasite um, after this chat. Um, but they have a, yeah, they have a very interesting documentary film that follows the lives of the eight women who can still sing these songs. Um, and it's very DIY, they filmed it all themselves and it's just, um, so it's, I feel like um, what's really refreshing about it is that the angle is not about trying to um, exoticize them, like that maybe some in previously, maybe if it was from a Western perspective to, um, you know, look at the indigenous Hong Kong people, there's a sort of weird power, uh, power play there, but this is grassroots, it's from the community and it's just them telling their stories and it's very empowering. So um, there's a link to that trailer. But so then the next series of images that I created was um, trying to um, represent the animals in each of the lines of the songs. So the first line is about the catfish and the next line is about the eel and then there's a carp and then the last one is a, a pawn, pond loach. And if I zoom in very closely to the, the animals, you actually see that inside the body is some Chinese characters because the way I've created this images is getting the Chinese lyrics here. And in Photoshop, I used the smudge tool as, as though it was a clump of clay and I molded it slowly into these different shapes. So for me, that was a way to um, keep the, the lyrics or the words in, inside the image, but not make it the primary focus so that the visual translation is still there, but the words are still inside each of the animals. Um, and then the same thing for the next verse. The next verse is about the birds. So we have a rice bird, and then we have a, I think a, a chicken, and then a partridge. And then this one, last one is a wat mei, I think is a type of bird with a line on its eyebrows. Um, so again, using these lyrics and then shaping them on Photoshop, liquefying those words to, um, to turn them into different shapes. And I think for me, again, um, the idea of language being very slippery and very easy to be manipulated or lost or um, it comes from my own personal background with um, losing my fluency in Cantonese and then trying to regain it again. And, and then at first not being able to speak English, but then learning English. So for me, I'm really interested and excited about the way that language can trans, transform over time. Um, and so th this is just another visual representation of some of those things. And then the next post is a 3D scan of my head with a traditional marriage um, phoenix crown on, on my head, but it is made with, um, I guess you could say futuristic materials. So we try to use more like metallic textures and um, uh, I guess uh, make it seem more contemporary and fantastical and um, a bit more kind of influenced by sort of Hollywood understanding of what Asia looks like. So this idea of um, Sino-Futurism, I'm very interested in, in the way that um, Asia is represented in Hollywood cinema as being futuristic and a little bit evil, or a little bit sinister. So trying to reclaim some of those um, aesthetics and use it for this project. Um, and then uh, my, and the last post is just my modern interpretation of that song. Um, and I guess for me, it was important to retain the melody, but to represent the song as though I would make it normally anyway. Um, because I think with traditional um, knowledge, it can be very easily put inside a museum and just forgotten about if it's just 
um, if there's no contemporary element to it. But at the same time, it's very easy to commercialize something and make it not connected to the original form. So um, I'm still trying to figure out how to do that in the best way possible. But for me, it's a very sustained project that this is only the beginning of it. And there's multiple, um, multiple iterations of this project and also with a lot of public platforms and public programming to help um, raise awareness that it's not just the music video clip. But I'll still show, um, yeah, I'll show you the modern interpretation. And for anyone who is sensitive to strobe lighting, there is a bit of flickering for this. So um, turn away if, if that is an issue for you. Thang sắp bình thao quay cầm dì quang mà A bạc xanh châu mù lòng ngô tan châu tốt sang ngà A chắc yu phong chơi châu yêu chăng xoay mà A này châu cao chốc châu âm u hoàng ngà我谷州浸灯 So that's the, the outcome of the, um, the research and, and trying to interpret it in this modern way. I was so glad to learn about this project because um, I, I, I feel like you're kind of, you know, kind of step, stepping um, back to kind of the backstage of the whole research and developing mm -hmm. a new approach to um, um, approaching um, this, you know, um, background of yours, and also to present um, work in a in a very uh, innovative way. Yeah, I'm Thank looking you. forward to to learn about like the new iterations or the next steps of this project. Yeah. So I mean, this is yeah. As I said, this is just the start of a much bigger, larger project. So um, eventually, this will be um, turned into a theater show, a solo theater show um, with. Uh, I think I can, I don't know if I'm allowed to announce it yet, but with some partner organizations in Hong Kong um, and in Australia. So um, I guess, yeah, like uh, for me, it's, it's, it's an ongoing thing and it allows me to um, go back to Hong Kong regularly, hopefully when we have a vaccine and, and keep learning from these uh, grannies and to also give back to the community as well. So it's been really nice to um, help them have an international platform. Um, and to also, they're just happy that someone of the younger generation is excited to listen to their stories and, yeah. <laughs> and learn their songs. Um, so that's been very uh, rewarding. And, and my mom as well, my mom, she's just so happy to, um, 
first of all, regain the confidence in her heritage to think, oh, wow, like, the, you know, my daughter is actually interested. But the songs that I've been learning, she heard when she was a, a child, and now I'm able to teach her the songs. So I think that has been very nice to come full circle. Um, and most importantly, it's the, it's the women's songs, and it's the women's knowledge, which, as we know in, well, society in general is very male dominated, very patriarchal, but within my tune culture, it's like the women have no rights. Their story is not heard. They, they, they don't mean anything. So to be able to elevate or to lift that, the, this group of women up and to foreground their stories and to then continue the thread as, as someone of that heritage myself um, has just been a, a absolutely phenomenal um, art project to embark on. Yeah, I feel it's very meaningful and also empowering for the in gender and I was looking forward to see the project going on theater so the international audience can see the heritage in Hong Kong. I, I think we have talked a bit on your projects and we opened the discussion for the audience. So um, if you have any question, feel free to unmute yourself. If you're shy, just type in the chat box so we will read your question and ask Rainbow. Maybe while the audience are preparing their questions, I'll ask the first one. So, um, um, like Rainbow, can you tell us more about what are you working on? What are you thinking of these days? Um, like, of course, in addition to this project. Mm. Yeah, um, so uh, I'm actually working on uh, another pop album so um, I always like to go between the more theoretical research things and just writing some uh, love songs I think so yeah I've got um, a single coming out early next year and at the moment I think um, I'm just resting <laughs> I've had a very, I've actually had a very very yeah I actually had a very busy year um, it, despite all the the COVID situation, but I think what's been very lucky about what I do is because I, I work so indisciplined, but my work is so interdisciplinary and flexible to be changed for digital platforms as well, that I've, I've actually had a, a, quite a few opportunities this year, which I'm very grateful for. So I'm just uh, having some downtime. Um, maybe I'll do, I love cooking. So I, I'm going to do a bit of cooking, going to make some dumplings. I think yesterday was uh, two days ago was Dongjit, right? So I gotta, I gotta make Tongyun. I, I missed the date. I gotta make Tongyun this week. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Anything from our audience? Any questions? Any feedback? Oh, I saw a project of you that you are making the dumpling. Maybe. Ah, yes. <laughs> about that project <laughs> yeah yeah so the tong yun i was um I, okay yeah maybe that's another thing that i i i mean that was just one of those um pop-up pop-up uh opportunities that happen because um i think normally that that blog does music things but they were trying to get musicians because they couldn't perform to do something that was a bit out of the ordinary. So trying to think of creative or innovative ways to keep people connected. So I, my one was a cooking show and teaching people how to make Tong Yun. Um, for me, Tong Yun is like, just one of those things that helped me stay connected to my culture. So my mum would always make it um, and we would help to do the rolling part. So she'd make the flour and then we'd help to roll and then put the um, sugar inside and then put it in the in the um, boiling water and so for me that that actual gesture of the kneading is very it's very nostalgic for me and it helps helps me to feel connected to my culture it, even though during a time of me being not wanting to learn Chinese and thinking in anything Chinese is silly and I wanted to be like everyone else in Australia the Tong Yun I was like I can't give that up that is just too delicious <laughs> So for me, that plays a very um, important sim symbolism. But yeah, my, my parents, um, when we moved to Australia, they opened a Chinese restaurant. So food was a very important part of my life growing up. Um, even though in Hong Kong, they, were, they had completely different jobs. So my dad was a designer 
and my mum was a florist but when they came here they their skills none of their skills um really meant anything in Australia so they they started opening a Chinese restaurant so um I think yeah for me food always has an important role in my life because it's also a symbolism of the migration story in my in my family as well thank you um I'm also curious about uh, you got a project that uh, you did a performance that, that is called uh, Broken for Show uh, 1996. And I yeah. think that one is really funny that you're using the Google Translate and talk in Mandarin and translate in English and sing, sing the lyrics of Chinese into an English version of the adaptation show. Maybe you can talk more about that project. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. So this one, I actually think that this is one of my favorite projects that I've done. Um, it's a very personal, personal story. It's following, I guess, yeah, my um, uh, migrating to Australia in 1996. So I thought I would try and sing some of the pop songs from that year, um, but using Google Translate, because I personally can't translate it. So I was like, okay, let's use Google Translate. And of course, when you use Google Translate, it's not perfect. So you get some very humorous results. So I was trying to look at the idea of um, uh, assimilation and migration, but through this humorous lens. So I'll, I'll share a bit of it. Um, at the beginning, um, so uh, another thing is I, I'm very inspired by the idea of failure and using failure as an aesthetic um, framework to actually um, point out again those tensions when things aren't quite right. So I knew that by using the Google Translate on my phone, um, and not actually being able to speak Chinese very well, that the things that come out will be very funny or incorrect, but it it worked really well, I think, in this space because um, yeah, people could see I was struggling on stage, <laughs> which is part of the performance. So I'll just, um, yeah, let's play a bit of it. Oh. Hello, everyone. 我是彩虹 I'm a rainbow 我的名字是彩虹 My name is rainbow 不好意思 Feel embarrassed 因为 Google Translate 没有广东话 because Google Translate did not spend Guangdong. Anyway, Google Translate may you uh you not because they are lonely dry squid. <laughs> because Google Translate doesn't have a Cantonese setting. So I have to use Mandarin. But Mandarin is not my sayings. So a lot of this is guesswork. Yeah, that goes on for a bit and then so I, I tell everyone my story of um, not being able to speak in, in Chinese very well and then reinterpreting a bunch of songs. So the first one um, is Killing Me Softly and I kind of created my own karaoke version of the video clip um, which shows how bad the translation is. And of course, when, you, when you're singing Chinese to a, a melody that wasn't written for Chinese, you get some bad, like the tones are not right. So I end up probably swearing at everyone on the stage or saying something inappropriate. So um, he, he's... Yeah. 
Learn to learn to hunt. Yachty, yachty, hmm. Learn to learn to. If you have time, I mean, it's a 20 minute performance, but um, it was very, very fun to do this uh, in, in different contexts as well. So in English speaking um, countries and then sometimes in Chinese speaking countries and, and when, when there are bilingual people in the audience, that's when it's the most successful because they can hear where it's wrong in both languages. But um, my parents also really liked this one. They thought it was very, very funny. And my mom kept saying like, why are you talking about like, Quite, quite food, you know? <laughs> so it's very like <laughs> it's yeah so it was um it was a very fun performance that one. well thank you so much rainbow for your sharing today so glad to learn more about your you know music practice research a uh, lot of other things as well um so i think do you have any questions uh last questions for our audience if um well, um, I guess if you want to get in touch, you can just send me an email or um, follow me on Instagram or something. But I'd love to also, yeah, keep in touch with you guys as well. And thank you so much for having me. It's, it's such a pleasure and such an honor to be connected to, you know, Parasite. I love, I love this space. And yeah, I'm just very glad to be here with you guys. Thank you so much, Rainbow. And this is our last uh, studio visit before Christmas. So everyone, including Rainbow, uh, Merry Christmas and also, well, Happy New Year and enjoy this time with family, with friends, um, have good food. Um, yes. Uh, yes. Make, maybe <laughs> dumplings, and <laughs> make, make Tong Yun together. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah, everybody, bye-bye. Um, we will upload this video to YouTube so you can check out over there again as well. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.